Isn't it great to be a believer? Amen. To believe that in his word. You know, how many, when it says, I'm more than an overcomer in Christ, do you believe that? Do you believe when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? I believe. Amen. Yeah. Do you believe when he says all your sins are forgiven? I mean, the list could go on and on of things that, that we need to hold on to and believe. Amen? And put our trust in him and uh, uh, be persuaded that... How many of you are persuaded he's more than enough? Amen? I, uh, uh, me and Carolyn kind of chuckled this week. I, uh, I went to see the, the back surgeon and it was supposed to be a uh, a post-op surgery thing, and uh, anyway, he sat down with us, and I, he, I told him, I said, I was really feeling much better, and Karen, when God spoke to you to anoint me with oil and pray, what was that, a couple Wednesday nights ago, and uh, uh, God started to do something in my back, and it's been doing really great, so they postponed the surgery, and but it was kind of interesting, the the back specialist was sitting there, and he said, you know, he said, I had a lady that was scheduled for surgery, similar to you, and said, I decided I'd do an uh, MRI right bo- the day before the surgery. And so when I did the MRI, the, the problem was gone. And he said, and she said she went to a prayer meeting, but, you know, the body does heal itself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so we, me and Carolyn sat there and kind of looked at each other, you know, and, uh, but I, I, at least the doctor made that much of a statement, you know. But God is good, amen? amen. And uh, God works so wonderfully in our lives as we believe and put our trust in him. Well, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Charlie and Steve, will you come? Charlie, would you lead us, please? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. Amen. Praise God. If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, get your Bibles out, and uh, we're going to look at... uh, Two passages of scripture, one found in John, the, the 14th chapter, and we're going to read verses 15 through 18, and then Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. While you're turning there, uh, uh, I want you to think this morning that, you know, I've said this before, but how many of you believe God really cares? How many of you really believe he cares about your life? That he wants to be involved in your everyday living. And he wants to direct your steps. He wants to guide your life. You know, one of the, the most powerful scriptures that I memorized many, many years ago was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, and he'll do what? He'll direct your path. Now, guys, I want you to understand it says you have to trust him. The real difficult problem in that verse is lean not to your own understanding. How many times are we guilty that we try to work it out on our own, that we try to figure it out, that we try to work through it? How many of you have ever had a sleepless night because you worried about a situation? Matter of fact, uh, uh, in a birthday party we was in, that was one of the questions. What causes you to lose sleep at night? And it was amazing that some of the people, you know, you worry about something, you have something on your mind, and, you know, but when you think about it, he says, if you'll trust God, you'll trust him with all your heart and not lean to your own understanding. You'll be able to get that out of the way, which is a toughie, but acknowledge him. And, you know, as you acknowledge him, his desire is to direct your steps. Isn't that pretty cool? And that's the way God cares for us. He, he wants to be in, involved in our life. Well, we're going to deal with the Holy Spirit. 
And one of the ways that God gets involved in our lives, can you imagine, let's read this passage of Scripture in John, the 14th chapter, starting with verse uh, uh, 15, it says, If you love me, you will obey uh, what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. And listen to what it says. For he lives with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, can you imagine? He says, I'm going to send you a helper. One of the words that we're going to talk about in the Greek is paraclete. And it means to come alongside. It means to aid, to assist. Matter of fact, uh, Carolyn and Ann and Vicky's not here, but they're big quilters. And I was doing some research. And, you know, how many of you on a cold winter night like to have a nice quilt or comforter? Isn't it? You know, if you've been out all day and you're in the cold and, and you've had to put up with bad weather and, and uh, you're going down the road and your windshield wiper flow, uh, falls off and, and you're out there trying to get the wind, and then you get to think, man, I can come home. There's going to be a warm house waiting for me and there's going to be a nice quilt. And I can snuggle up in that quilt and then if you have a little dog like I've got, he'll snuggle up on your lap and, and, and you know, and, and you can get in that recliner and, man, you think, it's good. It's good. Well, you see, when it talks about the paraclete coming along, it used, Carolyn, can you believe this quilt? It said it's like a quilt. It's like a comforter. It's like that warm blanket on that cold night that you can snuggle up to. And he comes along to be a helper, a, comfort, a comforter to you, to aid you in your difficult life. Isn't that pretty cool of God? And he says, I won't leave you alone. I'm going to send this Holy Spirit to be there to help you, to guide you. And we're going to learn all of these facts and realize how important it is to experience God's Holy Spirit in your life. You know, let me ask you a couple questions before we move to the next verse. These are kind of thought-provoking questions for you. I've already went through them several times, so I've got you to a disadvantage, all right? But question number one, do you think like Jesus? That's a pretty heavy question, isn't it? Do I think like Jesus? You know, do I respond like Jesus? When I'm in difficulty, how do I act? You know, do you get flustered pretty easy? Do you get set up, upset pretty easy? You know, Carolyn, between her and the doctors, they said, you know, at this age, things happen to you like that. And so Carolyn, she says, you know, you're gonna, I'm really praying for you because the older you get, you get pretty grumpy. <laughs> Boy, that cuts pretty deep. I'm glad I got a quilt to wrap up in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm glad God loves me and he's a comforter and, and uh, he can come along. So you need to weigh that out, you know, because Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In other words, as the Holy Spirit comes, he'll give you the thoughts of Christ. He'll give you and remind you of the word that you can respond like Christ, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, 4 and verse 12, it says the word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It will penetrate the depth of your heart. It will reveal the very intent and thought of your life. You see, how many realize it's important that we wake up and realize God has got a helper to help us Think like Christ. Act like Christ. Respond like Christ. Respond in difficult situations like Christ would respond, okay? So you think about that question, all right? That's a, that's a lot right there, isn't it? Okay, number two, are you able to discern what's right and wrong in this culture and society today? Well, that's a challenge, isn't it? Are you able to discern? You know, one of the things of the Holy Spirit, it gives us discernment. How many realize we need discernment? We need wisdom in this day and age that we live in. You know, one of my favorite verses, Karen says I got a lot of favorite verses, but it says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it 
liberally and without reproach, without being a respecter of person. If you lack wisdom, if you lack understanding, if you're having difficulty to discern what to do in life, he says, if you'll ask me, if you'll acknowledge me in it, if you trust me in it, I will speak to your heart and I will give you direction. I will give you discernment. Wow, that's pretty heavy. I'll give you wisdom to help you make the right kind of decision. I'll give you discernment how to respond and act in this sin-sick world that we live in. Amen? Number three, question. Does the Bible come alive to you when you read it? Does the Bible come alive? I mean, literally, sometimes does the words just leap off of the page at you? I mean, you're reading, I think, one of the amazing things about reading the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, sometimes you can read a passage or a chapter. You've read it several times. But one morning when you get up, you start reading it, and all of a sudden, it's just like He turned on all the bright lights, and it comes alive to you. And you realize, wow, I can live by that. I can obey that truth. I can respond in a positive way. You see what I'm talking about? There are moments that when you read the Word of God, it becomes revelation to you. It becomes God's real revealed Word. And it's that Holy Spirit that guides you into those truths. It's that Holy Spirit that causes it to come alive to you, okay? You know, here's the neat thing. Simple little thing. This is not in my message, but it just popped in my thought. When you read the Word, you know, just breathe a little prayer and say, Holy Spirit, you're there to guide me. Holy Spirit, you're there to reveal. You're there to give wisdom. Speak to my heart as I read the Word. May it come alive in my life and be meaningful. Don't you think it would be a simple little prayer to do? And yet it can cause the Word to leap off the pages at you and cause it to come alive. The last one. If you answered no to these questions, then you need to listen this morning, and you need to say, God, I need to experience your Holy Spirit. It needs to come to, to life within me. It needs to become meaningful and real, uh, and real to me. Now, I want you to think about this as we talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, let's go back, and we're going to read Colossians chapter 1, and Verses 9 through 14. And, and I want you to listen. It says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in this inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves to whom we have redemption forgiveness of sins. Isn't that a powerful passage of Scripture? But you see, his prayer, Paul is saying, I want you to have the wisdom of God. I want you to realize how much God cares for you. I want you to realize that, that he wants to bless your life and cause life to be more meaningful. Jesus said, I came that you have life and have it how? More abundantly. His desire. And what he was simply saying in that first passage, in John 14, he was saying to the disciples, I'm getting ready to leave. Actually, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to pay a horrible price. Your hearts are going to be broken. Fear is going to grip your life. Your whole world is going to start crumbling. But I have good news for you. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to send the third person of the Trinity, and he's going to be a vital part of your life. He'll lead you into wisdom. He'll help you in the difficult moments of life. He'll be there as a comforter. He'll be that quilt, that warm blanket to make life a little better. Amen? You see, as we go through this, and we're going through the book of Acts, I want you to realize it is of great importance 
of the year 2019 that we have a, an awakening and realize that God so loves us that he sent his Holy Spirit to be the guide, the helper, the comforter, to be the revelation. Can you imagine this? And I want you to think about this statement, guys. When you look at the church, I'm not talking about just Kincaid Christian. When you look at the church in, across America, as a whole, we could say something is missing in the church today. Would you not agree with me? Something's missing in the church today. The influence has been in a negative. Instead of our churches impacting our communities, the communities are impacting the church. You see, when I first started out this journey, guess what? Our school systems respected the churches, and things were scheduled around the church being in the center. Today, they don't care. The schools do whatever they want. The church has been moved to the outside. The influence of the church has almost become nothing in communities. Something's happened, and that's why I want to teach and preach on the Holy Spirit because we need an awakening. We need to realize the importance of the Holy Spirit working in the life of the church in the year 2019. You know, the Holy Spirit, how many realize, is the author of the Scriptures and the truth of God. I want you to listen to this passage of Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. And, and I love how this translation, it says, knowing this first. Okay? In other words, we need to know something here. Knowing this first, starting in verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Well, that's a heavy statement, guys. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private in interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, I want you to think about this Word of God. Sixty-six books, God-inspired, God-motivated, God-taking men, People of God speaking to them, revealing the Word of God and having it recorded and printed on the pages so you and I would have a guide in our lives in the year two. Isn't that pretty heavy? But I want you to understand that it was God-breathed. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit of God that moved these men to be able to speak it. Now, how many realize if God's Holy Spirit moved these men through the ages of time to write 66 books that reveal the will of God, the love of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God? Don't you think we ought to ask the Holy Spirit to help us interpret it? You know, I'm not against education, guys. I, I, I've got the equivalent of a master's degree. I went four years of college. I went two and a half years of seminary. And I believe that you need education. But how many of you realize it's not by the will of man that you can study and you can study and you can read and you can read unless you ask the Holy Spirit to help you? You'll just have a lot of knowledge. It's when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to your heart because that's why it says it's powerful, it's alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It'll cut into the very depths of your heart and the very depth of your thinking. You see, it'll reveal you when you're wrong. It'll help you see what is right. Now listen to this. Take your Bible and think about this. He says all Scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Not the will of men, but the will of God. Now, take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Well, you need to hear this. This is probably one of the most revealing things I'll say to you today. And actually, Paul said it all these hundreds of years ago. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, starting with verse 12. Listen to what it says. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man 
Without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about the things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment, for he has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct, but we have the mind of Christ. Can you imagine? Let me just paraphrase that for you. Without the Spirit of God, guiding you and directing you and revealing to you, you'll miss the truths of God's word. You know, here's one of the things. One of the Greek words for the word is logos. Logos means general knowledge. How many realize from the book of Genesis to the uh, Revelation, there is great knowledge. There's history. There's many, many different things that you can read. But another word is, my mind went... Uh, Help me, Carolyn. What's my other word I'm looking at? Rhema. Thank you. <laughs> We've been married 55 years. <laughs> it's Rhema, and Rhema is the revealed word of God. And what it means, it is revealed by the Holy Ghost. It is revealed by the Spirit of God that guides you in the truth. And as you read it, now here, here's the interesting thing. Do you realize that when we're talking about rhema, and when we're talking about this passage of Scripture, it says, without the Spirit of God, there is no discernment of this Word. But it's the Spirit of God that then gives you rhema, revealed Word. And you know what that does? It builds faith in you. It births faith that you can say, wow, I trust in God. I trust what God's saying in that area. I'll base my Decision of life upon that. How many of you realize when you heard the message of the gospel? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. In other words, when you hear the message of the gospel, something pierces your heart. Something grabs a hold of you. Something gets your attention. Is that not true? And a little faith begins to build and say, wow, I can believe that Jesus died for my sins. I can believe that he was nailed to a cross. I believe that they placed him in a tomb. But I believe that as it says in Corinthians 15, that he was raised from the dead. Amen. And he lives today and he wants to live in my life. And if I will open my heart up and believe with my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, I shall be what? Saved. How many realize that's the beginning of a journey? But how many times have you heard that message before you believed? Hmm? How many times you thought, I'm getting tired of hearing that message? But one day it pricks your heart. You can't turn away. You can't walk away. You can't move away from it. It's grabbed you. It's revelation. It's got down in the side of you, and it churns on the inside of you. And you think, man, I've got to make that decision. You see, and there's no peace until you open your heart up. And say, well, God, I believe that. I believe that truth. I believe you've got my attention. You know, there was a song back when I got saved. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. Oh, stubborn, hard-headed, rebellious, stupid, dumb. <laughs> Carolyn's grinning all them things, and she knew it. <laughs> but when that revelation came through, it changed my life, guys. How many realize this is the journey? If God inspired the Word of God, and it was God-breathed, it was Holy Spirit-inspired, it was Holy Spirit-driven, and then he turns around and he says, I'm going to send this comforter and he is going to lead you into truth. He is going to reveal truth to you that will literally change your life. Don't you think we ought to get to know him today? Don't you think we ought to open up and say, wow, I need to experience him in my life. Now take your Bible and this, uh, this kind of verify what I'm saying. Let's go to John 15, 16, excuse me, John 16. And in John 16, this start, and this look about uh, verse 7. Everybody got over there? John 16, 
and starting with verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but I depart... But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, the helper there is called. It's talking about the Holy Spirit again. And can you imagine? He was saying to the disciples, it's to your advantage. It's a pretty heavy thought, isn't it? It's going to be to your... Man, can you imagine if you was a disciple at that time? You're thinking, man, I've walked with you. I've ate with you. I've slept in the same camp. I've seen you in your good... Never seen you in your bad because I didn't see a bad. I mean, you've helped me in my fears. You've done all that. But how's it going to be an advantage? He says, it's going to be an advantage because I'm going to send this comforter. I'm going to send this helper. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And listen to what it says here in verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. You see, one of the key things of the Holy Spirit He convicts you, he convinces you of your need for salvation. How many people go through life thinking, life's good, life's good. Carolyn asked me this morning, we had this deep conversation coming down the church. She said, just tell me one good thing about when you was drinking. I thought, I can't remember any good things. (laughs) I remember waking up with a hangover. I remember waking up not really knowing where I was at until I got my bearing. I remember being sicker than you can imagine. But you know the scripture that always got me to throw that in? When you read Proverbs, it says, I woke up in my vomit. I woke up sicker than you can imagine. But I picked myself up and thought I'll do it again. Now that's just pure stupidity. That's addiction. So I can't remember one good thing. But I want you to understand what the Holy Spirit did. It began to convict me and it began to convince me that how foolish I was. It began to convince me that I had missed the mark. I missed what God had been talking about. Okay? And then you know what? Here's my battle. Here's my battle that I had. I thought, I'm not going to go religious. I've already tried that route. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to make a fool of myself. I don't want to make, you know, I don't want to be in and out, and I don't want to be what I can't be. And the old enemy played havoc with me. But it says, not only will it convict you of sin, it will convict you of righteousness, that there is a righteous way. His name is Jesus. And it's not my righteousness. Guess what? He gives me the gift of righteousness. He paid the price For my sins, he paid the price for your sins. Amen? He died on this cross, guys. Amen? And the scripture says it's a free gift of righteousness that he made us right standing in our relationship with God. Isn't that pretty good? So he convicts you of your sin. He convicts you that there is a right way. There is a better way. There is a way to receive life in its abundance. And then you know what? He says, not only that, there's a judgment to come. Those are three pretty heavy things that the spirit of truth does. All right? And here's what I did. You've heard me say this over and over. I'll never forget it. and never want to stop talking about it. But I listened to that message for six months. Old Curl and Eister, Steve. Get up on that old bucket in that drag line, and he'd start telling me about Jesus. I'd get so mad and I'd scream at him and say, get out of this cab. Leave me alone. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Old Curl went and go and I'd hear the old door slam. It wouldn't be 30, 40 minutes. I'd hear the door open, hear the old five-gallon bucket rattle. He'd get right up on that where he was talking right in my ear. He'd start in again. Six months that went on, sharing the truth, sharing. But on a Saturday night, working third shift, I got in that old truck. I headed for the mines. I was so frustrated with life at that point. So frustrated with life that I thought, wow, I didn't even like myself. Well, that's bad when you wake up and realize you don't like yourself. Didn't like anything. And here was my prayer, guys. I cried and said, God, if you're real, if you're everything that Kerwin Heisner has tried to impound into my head and my heart, 
If you're all of that, I need you tonight. I want to receive you. I want you to come into my life. Guys, I cannot explain in human terms what happened to me that night. The truth come alive in my heart. It changed my life. It transformed my life. Man, it was the best third shift I'd ever worked. I was so happy. I couldn't wait to tell Kerwin what had happened to me. I think he thought I was absolutely nuts that night. I got off that morning. I couldn't wait to get home. I got Carolyn out of bed. I said, come on, we're going to church together. we got to go. Scared her. She thought, what in the world? This is not the same guy. Who is this man come back in my house? And I want you to know, guys, God literally transformed my life. But do you realize that was the truth, the helper of the Holy Spirit, the work through Kerwin Heisner that sowed that seed and it finally took root and it got my attention. And when I cried out, God was everything that Kerwin said he was. He transformed my life, changed me. To my knowledge, I've never had another sip of alcohol since that day. My old buddies, my drinking buddies, I went and told them what happened. They said, we'll see you in a few weeks. You'll fall to pieces. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. Guys, it's been 50 years, or about 50 years, and it's better today than it was 50 years ago. What about you, Steve? You agree, don't you? You agree. And so I'm simply saying to you, as we go through this, the Holy Spirit is there. I mean, he's there to reveal this truth. He's there to be a help. He's there to guide you. Amen? He said, I'll not leave you alone. I'll not leave you like an orphan. I'm going to give you this Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to, I, I want to close with this. I'm, going to, I'm leaping about 10 pages, but I can do that. And everybody said, oh, glad, good, amen. Now, listen to this. I read this story, and I want to close with this story because I thought, man, oh, man, this is pretty powerful stuff. But the church, let's talk about the church. It becomes irrelevant when it becomes a purely human creation. How many of you agree with that? It loses its ability to impact. When we decide that we can do it as a human creation, when we decide that we can do it in our own abilities, we lose the impact of the Holy Spirit. How many of you agree with that? Now listen to this story. I thought this was pretty good, cool. Matter of fact, it says this may sound like a silly illustration, but I want you to listen to the truth of it. If I told you I had encountered God's Holy Spirit and he gave me supernatural ability and I play for an SIU basketball team. And I got up and declared, I've encountered the supernatural ability of God. He has given me the ability to be a star basketball player. What would you think? Too short. No. And so I go and I'm going to play for the new coach that came to SIU. They just hired this week. I can't run. I can't shoot three-pointers. I can't even dribble. I'm just a mess. But I declare that the Holy Ghost come upon me and it gave me the ability to be a star basketball player. But I can't function. Would you laugh at me? Would you think he's nuts? Hmm? Would you think something's missing? What do you think the world's doing to the church right now? What do you think the world's doing to the church? We declare that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We declare that we've experienced God's supernatural power. We declare that our lives have been transformed and different. And we go on living just like we did before. We go on doing business just like we did before. We get caught up in our abilities. And we do all of these different things in our own strength. And nobody sees the glory of God. Guys, as I take you through these messages... 
Let me tell you, the question that each one of us need to ponder, if we are missing something in our lives, we need to start crying out for God's Holy Spirit to come into our life, to give us revelation, to give us faith, to give us direction that transforms and changes our life. Because I'm going to tell you, this message that I want to proclaim to you, and this is kind of the introduction that we're talking about, God sent His Holy Spirit to make you like Him. God sent His Holy Spirit to empower you that you could continue the ministry of Jesus, that you could function like Jesus, that you could act like Jesus, you, you could imitate Him, that you could walk in His victory, you could experience His power, that you had words, the wisdom that would penetrate the hearts of people. The church needs a wake-up call. We're not even worthy to be number 10 on the team. We need a wake-up call. We need to go back to those questions and say, wow, is it alive to me in the year 2019? Is the Holy Spirit working in my life in the year 2019? Let's stand together this morning. Wow. Wow. How many of you realize, and I want you to hear this, I always remember this, a few things that I remember when I first started out. When I first started out, I taught a, youth class of teenagers. Boy, if you want a wake-up call in your life, just deal with a bunch of teenagers. And I shared with those teenagers what God was doing in my life. And I shared with those teenagers that I really felt a call in my life. And I'll never forget one of the kids that would make you want to scream at night, cry a few times, stressed you every way you could be stressed, come up to me and he said, Gerald, Always remember this. Now, this, uh, this uh, is kind of unique. He said, don't talk the talk unless you walk the walk. Isn't that pretty powerful? Don't talk a talk unless you walk the walk. It's time we have a wake-up call. We've talked the talk, but we've lost the walk of God in our lives. And so I want you to think about it as you bow your heads with me and, and you close your eyes with me just for a moment. I think it's time that we just get honest with ourselves, that we get honest with God, and that we cry out and say, God, I need that comforter. I need that helper. I need you to work powerfully in my life. Guys, I cried out, first of all, man, I want him more than I ever wanted him before. And my goal is I'll be up front with you. And I started these messages. My goal is that we would all have a desire to go deeper with him, to get closer to him, to experience him, that our lives would shine forth the glory of God in our everyday living. As you have your heads bowed, your eyes closed, it's your decision, it's my decision. But this make a decision and say, I want more. I want more of God. I want more of his Holy Spirit. I want his word to come alive to me. I want to encounter the freshness of the Holy Spirit working. I want that trust to develop that I can acknowledge him in all my ways and know that he cares and he's there to direct. He's there to guide. He's there to touch my life. I want you to pray. I'm going to pray, but I want you to pray individually. It says, how much more? Will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? This do the asking, and this let him do the working. This do the acknowledgments and say, God, help me. If I've sinned, help me ask for forgiveness. If I missed the mark, help me get back on track. If I look into my life and I, I don't have the joy of my salvation, restore the joy of that salvation. If I look at my life and realize, wow, I've just been struggling in my daily walk. I need help, God. I just need help. Well, guess what? He's the helper. He's the one who comes alongside and says, wow, I'll help you. Let's pray together. Father, I, I just sim simply believe honesty is the best policy. God, help us be honest with you this morning. Help us be honest in the evaluation of our lives. Help us be open to you this morning. And Father, help us 
to cry out this morning and say, God, forgive me. God, help me. God, work at my life. God, open the windows of heaven and pour your spirit out upon me. Cause your word to come alive. May, be, may it come alive and be refreshing. Oh, may it be so refreshing like on a hot day just having a cold glass of water. May it refresh my life. May it revive me. May it work powerfully in each one of us. Wow. Oh, may you agree to and restore the joy of my salvation. May you just work as only you can. I surrender. I surrender all to you and all I give to you. I give you my life. I give you my soul. I surrender. Well, well, well. I just express I love you, my Lord. I adore you. I just want to taste anew and afresh with you and see how great you are. Wow. Transform our lives. Father, I pray right now that you'll touch our lives. Father, I pray that you'll work powerfully, powerfully in each person here this morning. And thank you, Father. You're so good. Oh, you're so good. the praise. Wow. Wow. In Jesus. Oh, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, hug somebody around you. Tell them you love them in Jesus.